closer, okay? So, a man finds a lamp, and he rubs it, and a genie appears. The genie tells the man, hey, you could have two wishes, but anything that you wish for, your mother-in-law will get double. The man thinks about it, he goes, okay, my first wish, I wish to have a million dollars. And for my second wish, you could beat me half to death. Okay. So this is just an example of the countless mother-in-law jokes the internet has to offer. And it seems like popular opinion has it that mother-in-laws suck. But a woman by the name of Jerry Armbrust does not find that very funny because she loved her mother-in-law, a lovely 76-year-old woman by the name of Norma Davis. Now, Jerry had been married to Norma's son, Bill, for over 30 years before he passed away and admirably vowed to take care of Norma in her final years. But did Jerry underestimate how difficult it could be taking care of an elderly person? And did she grossly underestimate how long Norma would actually live? eventually tasking Norma's own granddaughter, Dana, who fortunately was a nurse, to take care of some of this burden. And by 1994, now it's been over a decade since Bill's passing, and Norma is now 86, and even still, her spirit for life seemed unwavering. But no matter how wonderful Grandma Norma is, someone believes that she has outlived her welcome. My name is Monks, and I'm lucky to have an amazing mother-in-law. <sighs> yes, I will always spin the cup. In the peaceful community of Canyon Lake, California, where Norma lived, a caring neighbor who loved Norma decided that it was strange that she hadn't heard from her in a couple of days now. So she walks on over and just knocks on the door. She finds the door unlocked, which is not uncommon in Canyon Lake, a very safe, gated community. The strange part was the thing that she found an issue with was the silence because Norma was hard of hearing and at this time of day she would be watching her shows on TV and she would turn the volume up to the max but this house was dead quiet. She would walk in and what she sees would haunt her for the rest of her life. 86 year old Norma Davis had a knife sticking out of her chest and her neck. Norma Davis was found murdered on February 16th of 1994. It was an extremely violent killing. And to detectives, it appeared to be very personal, like somebody was just extremely tired of this little old lady that spent her days watching TV shows, playing cards, golfing on occasion, just making the best use of the time she had left. We all should pretend we're 86. We would live a better life. Now, here are the clues that detectives had to work with. So the front door was unlocked. And like I mentioned before, in this gated community held little weight. Nothing of value seems to be missing. Norma still had on her jewelry. Her purse was still there with cash inside. A $148 social security check remained on the table. A wood-handled utility knife was in her neck and a fillet knife was sticking out of her chest. They would find two knives missing from the knife block. A phone cord was ripped from the wall. A size 6 athletic shoe print, believed to be Nike's, was lifted near the door belonging to either a woman or a smaller statured man. Now, autopsies would later reveal, besides a broken fingernail, just one broken fingernail, there were no other defense wounds or any markings on her body and that she had been dead for at least two days before being found, which adds a little bit of sadness to this case, which would mean that Norma was murdered all alone on Valentine's Day. Now, one detail that detectives were shrewd enough to note was that Canyon Lake was a gated community. You don't just go in and out Willie, Can Willie Canilli committing murders. Okay, pairing this with the fact that Norma didn't feel the need to defend herself, they probably didn't have to look much further than the gate logs of the people going in and out that were acquaintances of Norma. So while detectives were looking over the crime scene, conveniently, Jerry Armbrus 
walks in with a bag of groceries. For Norma, of course. Now, seeing all the police and detectives inside Norma's house, she's concerned. She asks, where's Norma? What happened to Norma? The detective would tell her the situation as best as he understood it. But his main concern were the Nike shoes on Jerry's feet. Now, Jerry would be asked to come down to the station to answer more questions. She agreed. This is when detectives learned of Jerry's peculiar relationship with the victim. I mean, it's very unusual for the daughter-in-law of the late husband to continue caring for the mother-in-law. And this is also where they find out that she had already remarried, which makes the situation even more strange. A man named Russell Armbrust, where she gets her last name from. This is where they also learn that the condominium Norma was living in was being paid for by the Armbrusses. They had keys and every reason to be inside the house at any time. They lived in Canyon Lake as well, so their logs at the gate might not prove to be very useful at this point. Now, after talking to Jerry, she would shoot straight up to the top of their suspect list, and here's why. Because she admitted to having seen Norma just the night prior to the murder, which made her, in the eyes of detectives, the last known person to see Norma alive. Now, they played it smart. They played it patient. They just told Jerry and Russell, thank you for your time, good day, and they let them go. Even though they didn't have a motive yet, they were leaning towards some type of financial gain, as these cases usually have, but mainly rage considering the brutality of Norma's murder. Now, the residents of Canyon Lake were unsurprisingly shocked by the whole situation that this could happen in their safe community. Doors began to lock and speculations about maintenance workers, gardeners, anyone who didn't live in the community started. Now, two weeks after Norma Davis's murder, this same community would be rocked to the very limits when it happened again. On the 28th of the same month, 66-year-old widow June Roberts was found murdered. Now, this was very reminiscent of how Norma was found. No forced entry. A phone cord was ripped from the wall. They would also find a shattered wine bottle on the floor, which they surmised was used to render her unconscious by hitting her in the back of the head. She didn't even see it coming. Now, unlike Norma, it's possible that June didn't even know this person was in the house or just like June, it was a person that she was comfortable enough to allow in her house and not even keep an eye on, okay? So after this, after being knocked out by the wine bottle, she was placed in a chair and then the phone cord was used to tie her up. It would also be used to wrap around her throat, ending her life. But once again, nothing of value appeared to be taken. She was an elderly woman that lived all alone and both had succumbed to an extremely violent attack. Now, regardless of the similarities, detectives had to find a more concrete link between the two murders and they would find something that would point them straight back to their prime suspect once again, or should I say, suspects. Now, before June was struck, she had been arranging some photos in a family album, as well as reading passages from her Bible. Now, within that Bible, detectives find June's prayer list, a list of her friends and their wishes that she would pray for. Now, amongst those names was Norma Davis. Now, although connecting the two victims as friends is a good start, what they find right after this could potentially lead to a fitting conclusion. So in June's photo album, they discover some familiar faces all together in just one photo. You have June and her late husband with Jerry and Russell. Now it turns out June's late husband is very good friends with Russell, which now ties the victims together and the one common denominator that they're looking at is Jerry Armbrust. Now, while preparing to line all their ducks in a row in a case against Jerry, a few snags proved a bit problematic. When they compared the shoe size and the shoe print, they didn't match. 
And as detectives sought to help forensic psychologists, they were again disheartened to learn that in expert opinion, considering the violent and up-close nature of the crime, the strength that it would take to even handle the victims in that manner, most likely the suspect was a man. I guess they were looking at the wrong half of the arm brushes. Just think about it. So Russell Armbrust was technically paying for his wife's mother-in-law from a previous marriage to live in a nice condo in Canyon Lake. Now, maybe Russell's patience was running out. His generosity was wearing thin along with his money. He was directly connected to June Roberts because he was close friends with her late husband, Dwayne. Now, maybe some sort of twisted love parallelogram okay existed where russell had to keep june quiet for some reason all the while the community was becoming unhinged with this second murder the police dispatchers were overwhelmed with calls from concerned citizens suspecting their gardener was the killer their maintenance man looked at them funny or they just saw a guy looking suspicious walking down the street elderly people were moving out of canyon lake in droves to find a new haven to find a new home detectives were in a rush to ease the community's mind and they continued to put together a case against the arm brushes except the puzzle just wouldn't fit no matter which way they turned it and how they looked at it and when the airtight alibis were confirmed for both jerry and russell they had to be crossed off the list and it was back to square one for this police force and they were understandably exhausted running out of leads running out of ideas but with one last ditch effort they decided to run the victim's credit and it was jackpot turns out that something was stolen from june roberts her credit card it was used the same day and now detectives had in their hands a printout of several locations that it was used at. The force divided the transactions up and rushed to each store to question the workers whoever came across this person. And this killer wasted no time running up the victim's credit. But there was one transaction that helped paint a very vivid picture of who they were looking for. A woman just 45 minutes after the attack of June Roberts had treated herself to a Manny Petty and a haircut, all courtesy of June's visa. She was about 5'5", 130 pounds, and had a young boy with her, according to the stylist. A police sketch artist would create a composite from this employee's description, as you see here. But... Before the police would even have a chance to follow up on this new lead, three miles away from Canyon Lake in Lake Elsinore, another victim was reported. Again, reminiscent of the first two murders, except this woman survived. 58-year-old Dorinda Hawkins was working all alone at an antique store when a woman came in and inquired about picture frames. Before Hawkins realized what was happening, she was being strangled with a telephone cord until she lost consciousness. Now, the attacker stole $5 and a credit card from her purse and another $20 from the register. And fortunately, the killer in her haste didn't check to see if Dorinda was still breathing now in her hospital dead with horrific ligature marks on her neck barely able to speak she told detectives the chilling account especially what the attacker said to dorinda as she was pleading for her life to just go ahead and take all the money the killer said i'm not here for the money just stay calm and it'll be all over soon that's some chilling shit. Dorinda surviving this attack would be the crucial piece that detectives needed. And when the police sketch artist was summoned, the drawing was uncanny. With the initial drawing, it was practically the same woman. But who was she? Detectives took the composites and followed up with even more of that credit card shopping spree. And it really did seem like the killer felt she needed a reward every time she committed one of these attacks. Another hair salon 
had made it onto the charges. And that's where detectives learned that a woman matching the sketch had just dyed her hair red. She was maybe feeling the heat of the police that were hot on her tail. She might be going for a disguise, trying to change her appearance. But of course, having all this information, having two composite drawings and knowing that she dyed her hair red didn't really mean anything if you didn't know who the person actually was. So detectives were at a standstill and they would turn to somebody that they never ever thought that they would. Jerry Ambrose, their initial prime suspect. They visited Jerry at her home. They gave her the physical description of the woman and let her look at the two composite drawings, telling her that she had just dyed her hair red. She had just gotten her nails painted. Jerry mulled over the sketches and really tried to help the detectives. But in the end, she just didn't know the woman that fit that particular description. She didn't even know a woman with red hair, especially one with an eight-year-old son. So... Detectives thanked her for her time, and they left. The following night, Jerry and Russell were enjoying their evening at home when Russell's daughter, Dana, dropped by for a visit. Jerry's heart dropped when Dana, who usually is a blonde, was now a redhead. She was about 5'5 and 130 pounds, and things started to click in Jerry's mind, she remembered that Dana had a new boyfriend that had an eight-year-old son that Dana was taking care of most of the day. She then realized that Dana also was responsible for taking care of Norma when she was murdered. The following morning, Jerry was already at the police station ready to give up the name of her daughter-in-law. Dana Sue Gray. Jerry provided a photo and detectives realized that it looked just like the composite drawings. Detectives wasted no time heading out looking for Dana, but this would not be an easy task. So this, everyone, is Dana Sue Gray. Now, she lost her job as a nurse a while ago, having been used to living in a nice community of Canyon Lake with her dad and her stepmom, used to having her daddy's money to spend, used to having her own money to spend before she lost her job, she's used to having money to spend, the finer things in life, but then she decided to move out. And now she's living on the outskirts of Lake Elsinore with her mechanic boyfriend while taking care of his eight-year-old son. But old habits die hard, now don't they? And Dana would keep spending, like the good old days, except now it was her boyfriend's credit card. And before she knew it, before he knew it, it was maxed out to the limit with a debt of over $10,000. His card hit its limit and it would no longer swipe. Similar to how you would feel not keeping track of your Dave & Buster's card. A stakeout was placed at Dana's boyfriend's house and they patiently waited for her to come out or to come home. But Dana was about 10 miles away in a place called Sun City and she herself had set up her own stakeout on an 86 year old lady named Dora Beebe. Now, once she knew that the elderly woman was all alone, she got out of her car and knocked on her door. She pretended to be lost and the sweet old lady allowed her inside to look at her maps. Now, it didn't take long for Dana to utilize her surroundings as she ripped the phone cord out of the wall, as she always does, and proceeded to strangle Dora with it. She then grabs a clothes iron and bludgeons her to death. Her violence was escalating, and not long after this, she leaves. Nora's body is discovered, and the Sun City police are called again. Nothing appeared to be taken from the crime scene, but after learning that Dora only paid with checks and not credit cards, they learned that her checkbook was indeed missing. Now, back at Lake Elsinore, the police are still waiting patiently outside her house. And what do you know? Dana pulls into the driveway. She's with the eight-year-old boy, and they head into the house with plenty of shopping bags. The police surround the house with their guns drawn, and they knock on her door. Dana answers and they immediately apprehend her. Of course, she's like, why, why? What are you guys doing? What is this? I don't know anything. Detectives would find inside the home 
a treasure trove of luxury items most of them just recently purchased and they also find drum roll dora bb's missing checkbook now in the interrogation room and this is just gonna be my opinion dana really showed how dumb she really was she's a smart person don't get me wrong but Smart people are allowed to be dumb in high tense situations, and this is going to be a prime example of one. Now, besides the fact that she basically left a paper trail a mile long with all her purchases that she made with dead people's credit cards, but she was about to slip up so moronically, it's laughable. And I'm telling you guys, it's okay to laugh at her when you guys hear this, okay? So Dana would be presented with the composite sketches and she would look at it and go, that's cute, but that don't look like me. They would present her with evidence of a shopping spree on the victim's credit card. She goes, what shopping spree? The shopping spree that corresponds to all that wonderful shit that we just found in your fucking house. Dana continues to feign ignorance. The detective then turns on the pressure and flat out accuses her of spending Dora Beebe's money on all those diamonds and shoes that she had just brought home. Dana doesn't fall for it. She remains cool as a cucumber and tells him that she doesn't know anything about a Dora Beebe. She's then presented with retail evidence of her recent shopping spree. Dana starts to panic and changes her story a bit that she did go shopping but that she found the checkbook in a trash can. The issue with this story was, who said anything about a checkbook? With that, the detectives just left the room and allowed Dana to marinate in her own folly. A handwriting expert would confirm that it was in all likelihood that Dana had signed the checks and remember those Nike shoe prints lifted at Norma Davis's murder. Well, after confiscating her extensive shoe collection, they found the exact size sixes in her closet. Dana is then placed into a lineup, the one victim that survived, Dorinda Hawkins. She breaks down and cries when she sees Dana. She positively identifies her as the attacker. And now the detectives, they could feel it. Their job is almost done, but they have one more loose end that they need to tie up. And that was motives for the murders now for june dorinda and dora i mean besides dana being just a straight up serial killer the motive could be as simple as money and that could be easily explained because of the shopping spree but what about the murder of norma davis her own grandmother well of course we already know that that's not her actual grandmother and let's not forget that her father was paying for this condo that Norma was living in and according to family members those close to Dana this made her incredibly jealous and a resentment started to grow as she was now living in the boonies with her mechanic boyfriend taking care of an eight-year-old struggling to even go shopping she figured that if she got rid of grandma norma she her boyfriend and her boyfriend's son could move in and she'd be back in canyon lake the community that she felt she deserved dana sue gray would be documented as a serial killer i do believe if you kill three people within a month and show no signs of stopping of course you would be labeled a serial killer and she would be just the 36th woman to be given that label she was given life in prison where she remains today now i'm gonna end this story with one of the little but disturbing details of this case her boyfriend's son the little eight-year-old boy he would wait in the car patiently as dana would run off to commit these horrifying crimes and he would just wait there and wait there not knowing what's going on and when she comes back Happy face on, sits down, and they go on a shopping spree. She would buy herself something, she would buy him something. How does he feel knowing now what was going on while he waited? I ramble on. Special thanks to Rebecca for suggesting this case. And much love to my Patreons, Invertiblade, KBG, Uncool Dre, Jan702, and Tony Huynh, who 
decided to patron twice. I appreciate that. That is twice as nice. And of course, the rest of you guys as well for allowing me to share with you these stories. Now, go protect the ones you love and love. The ones that protect you. <laughs>